Globalization, the free flow of goods, money, and ideas to all corners of the earth. It's a nice image. Open this opportunity, information highways crisscrossing the web to connect us in one global community. But it's also a myth. A pretty picture used to paper over an ugly truth about how the United States rigged the global economy to enrich itself at the expense of the rest. Let me tell you something. The United States of America is the most powerful nation on earth, period. Period. In a secret conversation recorded in the Oval Office, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger described this project in striking detail. Quote, the trick is to use economics to build a world political structure, he said. A structure that would guarantee our supremacy, even if it meant making the world poorer, sicker, and less safe. So how did we do it? How did the US design globalization to support its quest for supremacy? And what does it mean for people like you and me today? To answer these questions, we've got to go back to a small town in rural New Hampshire called Bretton Woods. There in July, 1944, 730 delegates from 44 nations gathered to rebuild the world after a decade of total war. Prosperity, like peace, is indivisible, said the U.S. Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau in his inaugural speech. Delegates imagined a new fund to support indebted countries and stop capital flight. They imagined a new global bank to invest in development, a new corporation to stabilize the price of primary commodities like food. The whole system would be backed by gold with an exchange rate fixed to the US dollar. But economist John Maynard Keynes was worried. The chief British negotiator knew that a system based on the US dollar could only survive as long as America itself held a trade surplus. The moment the US itself entered into a trade deficit, its neighbors would rush for gold and the whole system would collapse. So Keynes suggested that instead of building the new world order on the dollar, all major economies enter what he called the International Clearing Union, the ICU. While keeping their own currencies in central banks, countries would agree to denominate all international payments in a common unit, which Keynes called the Bancor. Once set up, the ICU could act as a kind of central bank to the world. It could tax trade surpluses and deficits symmetrically so as to balance out capital flows and build that indivisible prosperity that the United States claimed to pursue. But U.S. Chief Negotiator Harry Dexter White said, absolutely no. The United States was unwilling to replace the dollar as the currency of the new global economy, and it was most definitely unwilling to be taxed for its growing dominance. Instead, the U.S. granted itself special veto power over the newly formed IMF and World Bank. It built their headquarters in its own capital, Washington, D.C., and introduced a gentleman's agreement with its European allies to guarantee control of their top positions in perpetuity. But global supremacy is expensive. By the late 1960s, the United States was drowning in expenses from its heedless wars in countries like Vietnam and Cambodia. Our share of the world economy was rapidly in decline, and the share of other countries like France, Germany, and Japan was rapidly on the rise. And just as Keynes had predicted, the Bretton Woods system could not handle the strain. French President Charles de Gaulle announced that his country preferred gold to dollars, citing the quote, monumentally overprivileged position that the world has conceded to the American currency. In response, US President Richard Nixon made the sudden decision, unilateral decision, to ditch gold altogether. On a Sunday night in August, Nixon went on television to tell the world, dollars were no longer backed by gold. Deal with it. In recent weeks, the speculators have been waging an all-out war on the American dollar. The strength of a nation's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy. And the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. 
But how could the US guarantee its monumentally overprivileged position after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system? Nixon had a plan. In July 1974, he dispatched a delegation to the coastal city of Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. There, his treasury secretary would make a strictly secret deal with the Saudis. We send you arms and you invoice Saudi oil in dollar denominations. Thus was born the petrodollar, ensuring that global oil trade was done in US dollars, and in doing so, strengthening its status as the global reserve currency. Controlling the world's reserve currency not only allows us to print and spend money as we please, it also allows us to bully our adversaries with sanctions, embargoes, and exclusion from the global banking system. But owning the infrastructure was not enough. The United States wanted to dominate the flow of goods that passed through it. By the 1980s, countries were engaged in what Pfizer's CEO then described as a tense worldwide struggle for technological supremacy. Pfizer and other large US corporations were terrified of losing profits to poorer countries as they introduced high technology interventions, calling on the US government to protect what they claimed was their intellectual property. The US government heard their call. Using a trade law known as Section 301, the US bullied poor countries like Brazil and India in secret black room consultations if they did not cease production of generic drugs that corporations like Pfizer claimed to own. Finally, after years of Section 301 harassment, the US got its way. In April 1994, 117 nations signed the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, or TRIPS, requiring each and all of them to respect US claims to copyright or face severe consequences. It is this intellectual property regime that guarantees our ability to capture a disproportionate share of global profits. Apple, for example, uses its claims to intellectual property to capture nearly 60% from the production of iPhones and MacBooks, while the Chinese firms that actually make the stuff claim only two. So fast forward to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we can see how these rigged rules shape our world today. The privilege of our currency allowed us to spend our way out of the crisis when other countries remain trapped, drowning in debt. Our power in the Bretton Woods institutions allowed us to dictate the terms of global recovery when other countries could not and our control over intellectual property allowed us to hoard vaccines when other countries had not received a single dose. This is a story of global injustice, but it's also a story of tremendous self-harm. The US set out to make the global economy into a zero-sum game. We win, you lose. But there are huge costs to global supremacy here at home. A prolonged pandemic, for example, or the death of manufacturing jobs as US corporations look for bigger profits abroad. As Keynes reminded us back at Bretton Woods, it doesn't have to be this way. We can build shared prosperity. We can drive global sustainability, and we can save millions and millions of lives away. But first, we have to give up on the dream of domination. And as Henry Kissinger's long tenure at the top of American politics attests, that is a dream that dies hard.